A little more. Good morning. All right. It's good to see everybody this morning. We're glad that you're here. Many are still coming in. That's okay. We don't charge for people who are late or any extra. We are glad that you're here this morning, glad that you've come to be a part with us. It's exciting to be a part of the West Freeway Church. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to uh, remind you, or if you're visiting for the first time, let you know that uh, on the left-hand side of the pew is a registration booklet. There's this place for visitors to sign the top two sections. There's plenty of pages in there. Just go ahead and fill one of those out. Members, you know what to do. Fill out the bottom part. Let us know who all's here and if there's any changes that, need, that uh, we need to know about. We have uh, a lot of folks that are uh, gone this week and uh, out of town. We want to keep them in our prayers. This is uh, the week beginning uh, Thursday uh, for those that can and, and uh, all the way through Sunday. The uh, camping, uh, our spring camping event will be at Fort Richardson up in Jacksboro. So uh, there'll be a lot of us that'll be out for that. And a lot of people will be gone next Sunday, but uh, they're going to be worshiping together up at, uh, at Jacksboro at the State Park. And Brandon is doing a good job with that and getting our, uh, the church family involved and, and doing a lot of things like that. It's, it's going to be exciting. I hope that you have, if you have not signed up to go, I think we've got if it one slot left. We've got one slot left for a tent or, or a place where you can just take your car and sleep in your car. I don't, we don't care. Uh, but we'd love to have you come and go with us and, uh, and let you know about that. But we're going to have a great time uh, doing that. Uh, but like I said, they'll be staying over. Brandon is, is taking care of that and uh, looking forward to it. But we are also looking forward to this evening here at the building. We're going to have Fifth Sunday singing here. And uh, we'll have Christians from other congregations here. Uh, Chris has put together uh, several that are going to be leading songs and uh, going to be looking forward to that. And also, I think the song leaders over at Western Hills. And so we're excited about that. Come and be a part. We're going to do some outstanding singing uh, this afternoon at, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock here at the building. Looking forward to uh, our worship this morning. But before we do that, we want to make sure everybody is uh, welcomed. So let's put on a great big smile. Let's be standing. Let's greet one another and be preparing for worship. Let's be standing. Adore him, praise him, angels in the night. So the Lord is Praise him, all the stars above. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy Father, as we gather together on this Lord's Day, believers know that every day is Lord's Day. And we're so thankful for the love and the grace that you show for us. For we know that we're not perfect. And when we stumble and fall, you offer us the opportunity to be restored. We thank you for Jesus, the life he lived, the example he set for us to follow. And with that example, and if we follow it correctly, we can enter through that narrow gate. Lord, we just thank you. We love you for loving us and blessing us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture reading today is from Matthew 26, 45 through 49. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Lord, who is on our side, Give us all. 
He arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ been singing songs of celebration and victory in Christ. And so it came to pass that the only Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, was offered as a sacrifice on the cross for the sins of many. It was an event unprecedented in the world. And so without... Uh, there's no reason to think that everyone would find it easy to believe that he had risen from the grave, but he did, and he appeared to Mary following his escape from the tomb, and then to the disciples. But in John's gospel, chapter 20, in verse 24, it says, Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came, when the other disciples told him they'd seen the Lord, he declared, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, <clears throat> Our Father, thank you for your unspeakable gift of Jesus who gave his life for the sins of many, taking away the sting of death and of sin and giving us life eternal. We remember his death, Father, now by partaking of this bread as a symbol of his body given for us. May we take it in a way that's 
appropriate and pleasing to you in all solemnity as we believe what you have taught us. In Jesus we pray, amen. Perhaps one of Paul's greatest chapters he wrote was 1 Corinthians 15, confirming the resurrection of the Lord. And he reminded the Corinthian church that it's true that Jesus was raised, and yet some were questioning, saying, according to their earlier beliefs, that there is no resurrection. But Paul said, if there is no resurrection, then your faith is futile. You are yet in your sins, and we are false witnesses of God because we testified that he was risen, but if there is no resurrection, then even Christ has not been raised, and we are of all men most pitiable. I see ourselves in Thomas doubting and his belief, and there's nothing but a human frailty that we all deal with as we have moments of, of doubt and questioning, and I think that's a healthy thing because we're brought back to the central message of the Spirit, which is the cross. When we say today, let's go to the crux of the matter, you know what that's referring to? The cross. We use it in everyday speech. The central message of Christianity is the cross. And the victory that it provided over sin and death. And we're going to remember his blood that was spilled as we partake of this fruit of the vine. Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, thank you for this great opportunity to meet with our brothers and sisters in fellowship around the world on this Lord's Day. And partake of this fruit of the vine as we remember his great gift for us. Father, let us partake of it and take him into us that he might live anew in our lives. In Jesus, amen. amen. Whether in a physical relationship or a spiritual relationship, when we love, when we love, we want to give. And we have this opportunity to give today and show our love for God and for his church. I believe this with all of my heart. I'm richly blessed, both physically and spiritually, because of my relationship with God and with you. And I know this, every time I give, God blesses me even more. His shovel's a lot bigger than mine. And he showers us with his gifts and his blessings. Bow with me, please, as we take this contribution together. Heavenly Father, for the great gift of life and even our breath and for the wherewithal to live on a daily basis, we thank you. It all comes from you. And may we give with the spirit of love that shines through the world so that they can see through our love that we are yours. In Jesus we pray, amen.
time our children will join us with Coins for Christ and save for a message from Brit. If you'll stand with me, they'll go on to Bible Times after that, but if you'll stand with me, let's sing a song right before our lesson. If you'll give me just a half a second, this lesson goes with our message for if anyone was tempted and tried, it was Jesus and betrayed. And second, invite a friend tonight. There, a friend from outside the Lord. Bring them. There's two things that impresses people about the Lord's church. It is the fellowship of all believers. We don't have a clergy class. And second, our beautiful, beautiful a cappella singing. And they are very impressive to others, and there's no better expression of them than our singings together. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested the limb wrong. By their blood, the will know all about it. By Day. Good. I've got a question for you. How many of y'all have a friend? You got a friend? Me? You got a friend? All right. How many of you have a really, really, really good friend? All right. How many of you love your friends? You love your friends? I do. I love my friends. Oh, good. She has one and she loves him right there. That's daddy. I love it. Well, let me tell you something, guys. There's something very important about friendship. When you have a friend, when you have a friend, they are there for you no matter what. But there's always going to be somebody out there that wants to be your friend, but not for the right reasons. So always be careful that whenever you take on friends and you get friends, that you become a friend back to them as well, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for each and every one of these young children and, and their parents. And Father, those that are uh, bringing them, and, and we are so thankful for that. Father, today as they go to their uh, Bible times, we pray that you'll bless those teachers that are working with them. Thank you for this special time that we have each Sunday to be together and, and just to share something together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Y'all are dismissed. Y'all can go back to Bible times. All right. Yay, yay, yay. High five. That's my girl. Hey, goodness. There you go. Good morning, church. Isn't it great to be together? I've got some news that I need to share with you that I was given. First off, I forgot. Somebody said, you forgot to re-announce the fact that we're going to have cookies after fellowship tonight. Are you going to bring all the cookies? And I said, oh, no. Please bring cookies tonight. Uh, we want to do that and share. Uh, if you're not in the sharing mood, get over it and just bring some anyway. Just want you to know. We want you to be here. And uh, like, like Chris said, bring somebody with you and and I, I promise you, you'll enjoy it. We'll have a great evening this afternoon. Also, we are a blessed church, are we not? And we have had so many come this year to be with us, and we're thankful for that. We've, we've had a lot have, that we've lost, and we're, we're mindful of those. But today we celebrate that Mary Shackelford is now wanting to place her membership here. I think she came to us from Western Hills. Mary, where are you sitting she was about, there she is right there. Let's welcome Mary Shackelford. Thank you, sweetie. Appreciate you. Look forward to getting to know you. I've talked to her on the phone several times. And I, if you know when Mary calls, she's got one of those distinct voices, and I love it. I, I, think, I thank God. Whenever I got off the phone with her the other day, uh, I, I, I said, God, thank you for people like that. Because I'll remember her voice for the rest of my life. Thank you, Mary, for being here and wanting to be a part with us. I ran, getting used to this new jacket, hang on just a second. Have you thought about what it means to be betrayed? Have you ever been betrayed? Some of us have. I've talked with some of you. Uh, I think that uh, you look down at uh, John Richardson, and uh, I think Tuesday, is it Tuesday? It's going to be 46 years that she's had to put up with you. It's things like that that really touch my heart. Betrayal, however, is something that touches my heart also. As a child, there's nothing worse on a child than betrayal. A friend, and if you have not raised teenage daughters, you do not understand that kind of betrayal. But if you've raised teenage daughters, you understand it because you see it in the boys, especially if your daughter is first. You see it in the boys afterwards, but it is not to the intensity of a child who is female because that betrayal runs deep. But it runs just as deep in males as well. It's just that that emotion is held within to a certain extent. And I've thought about the pain of betrayal. I thought, what does it mean? In Matthew 26, 47 to 49, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived and with him a large crowd, armed, 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 with swords and clubs. And they were sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, there's that word. The betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man arrest him. And going at once to Judas, or to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. I ran across a memo a few years back that made the rounds. Oops, sorry. And it, I'm, I'm having trouble. My, it's my bad. Not, don't, y'all don't worry. It came from the Jordan River Area Management Consultants. How many of you ever heard of that? Eh, some, of us, some of us preachers may have seen this. But it's addressed to Jesus. Let me read it to you. Thank you for submitting the resumes of the 12 men you have picked for management positions in your new organization. All of them have now taken our battery of tests. We've not only run the results through our computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultants. The profiles of all the tests are included, and you will want to study them carefully. As a part of our service, we will make some general comments. These are given as a result of staff consultation and come without any additional fee. It is the staff's opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise that you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We recommend you continue with your search. 
Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew absolutely has no qualities of leadership. The brothers James and John place personal interest above the company loyalty. Thomas is a skeptical attitude that would tend to undermine morale. It is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. And James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus have radically, radical leanings and show a high score on the manic depressive scale. Only one shows great potential ability, resourcefulness, a business mind, and meets people well. Ambitious and highly motivated, we recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. Does it bother you that this article shows that there might be something so wrong with Judas? To look at it in those eyes? We see it through the Bible, and we understand it through the Bible. We see all those things that are kind of mixed together, and we say, ah, you know, Judas had a, had a hard way about him, but did you, were you waiting for that punchline, or were you listening to what was said before about those besides Judas? The pain of betrayal did not lie just with Judas. Or as a result of his act of betrayal. I've always said that old saying, hindsight is twenty twenty. I believe that. And when I look at life, it's a very similar way to the way that it was when Jesus was walking the earth. When I look at this world, I see it no different. People are still people. I like the way Helen Cothran says it, people don't change. And we don't. You know, we think about those things. And, and, I, and I look at it, and the idea of the death of Jesus is something that we need to take very seriously. And, I, and at times when we commune together, and thank you so much, Hugh, for the insight that you shared with us this morning. I needed that today to refocus. Because the last few days of Jesus' life should come to mind and we, and we read this situation in all four Gospels about the last days that Jesus was here, and there's a definite pain connected to those last few days. But here is the problem. It wasn't just Judas. Yes, he was the main culprit, and we're going to talk a lot about him today. But I think it's important that we understand that there's a definite pain connected to that betrayal. Let's get a quick glimpse of this in Luke 22, 1 through 6. The festival of unleavened bread, which is also called the Passover, was approaching. And the leading priests and teachers of the religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus. But they were afraid of the people's reaction. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve disciples, and he wanted to, he, and, and he went to the leading priest and the captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted. They promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so that they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. The Jewish leaders were ready to kill Jesus. They were ready to take his life. They had resolved to put him to death. How? Well, that was the only question that they had. They didn't care how. They could have stoned him. And they would have been just as happy. They could have, have killed him with the sword at that moment, but they wouldn't have been justified by the, the things that were going on and, and making sure that they kept the law and that, and that they kept everything going the way that it should. The feast of the Passover was at that time. They had the Jews in Jerusalem under their control, or at least the majority. Jesus was popular at the time and growing in popularity. I think that's something that we need to understand but the chief priests and the council of the Jews had decided that during this feast, we're going to take action. We're going to do something. We don't know exactly what yet. We've got a betrayer. 
We've got a, a victim. And we've got a need. The betrayer was Judas. The victim, Jesus. And the need was their own need for remaining in power. And it was a need that ate on these men. And it fed, and they fed off of each other. One would say something negative, or they would hear something negative about Jesus, or maybe somebody would even make something up about Jesus. And they were ready and willing and able to jump on that and to take that and explode that so that it fell on all ears. The unexpected betrayal by Judas was a present too gracious to be overlooked. The sight of the Jewish leaders coming to terms with the traitor apostle for the destruction of Jesus suggests, only, only suggests for me, some humbling lessons. And I, and, I, and I say only suggest because I think we can learn them other ways. But I want us to pay attention this morning because it shows me here that there really was not much difference between submission to Jesus and hostility against him. There's not a lot of difference. That line is very thin. It's like, the, the, it's like the line of law. You're either on one side or the other. You can walk up to the edge, but you, when you step across, you know it. I don't believe it's possible to ignore Jesus. I don't believe the world does. The Jews couldn't. They wanted him dead. He was, an outside, he was outside of their dominance or, 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 or their, uh, uh, their control. They were ready to kill him. Judas understood that concern he was upset because Jesus had allowed this woman to pour this expensive perfume on him he didn't understand that that money could have could have helped feed the poor the only thing is is that what he was really saying is is I could have had 20 or 30 or 40 percent of that because he was known to be taking from the purse they were ready to kill him Judas found a way to betray Jesus, and there was no middle ground for Judas. No alternative between discipleship and becoming the enemy. No alternative. He saw no way out. There's no middle ground for us either. We need to understand that if you are not all gods, then you belong to the enemy, Satan. And God versus Satan every day of your life. And somebody says, well, I haven't been tempted in a long time. Oh, don't say that. We were discussing this last week about how great things are going here. We're talking about it in ladies' class. I'm tickled pink, if you could believe that. I know Jim Turner wouldn't appreciate the pink, but... I, I'm excited about what's going on here, and I'm glad of what's going on here. But, you know, it, it, every time something like this happens, Ron and I talked about it last week, Satan's going to try to mess it up. And he's going to use little bitty things, little things that somebody says, little things that somebody does, attitude, just somebody snapping at the wrong moment, somebody uh, getting upset over something so minor that all they had to do was just forget it and walk on and walk away from it. But yet it festers and becomes a problem. We've got to be careful because Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty three, if a person is not with me, he's against me. The person that does not work with me is working against me. It goes back to that old saying. It's almost 30 years old now. What would Jesus do? That's all we have to ask ourselves. How would Jesus react in this situation? What would he do? Because there is no middle ground. Trust or do not trust. There is no middle ground. You're either on God's side or you're not. You're either for God or you are a betrayer. And the pain of betrayal is whenever we start walking away from God. Not just Judas, but us. Jesus will, will still be concerned about the lack of commitment of his disciples 
throughout all time. But can you imagine what he felt when Judas showed up knowing that it was going to happen? Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. They were sleeping. He said, just keep watch with me. Pray with me for an hour. He's talking to all the disciples and they're there and he says, then, you know, he says, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. That's a culmination of what was said earlier. Jesus, or Judas was paid to, to keep the arrest quiet. He didn't tell anybody else. He gave the Jews the opportunity to not be noticed by the crowd. And that, you know, the sad thing, what is that? Earlier in their lives, these same men who were arresting Jesus would have stood with him if his kingdom was going to be a physical kingdom. If he was going to try to destroy Rome, they would have stood with him and fought with him. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. See, Judas was the point man. Judas was going to point out who Jesus was. And he knew where Jesus could be found. He didn't hesitate to lead the men there with armed guards to arrest him. He finally became a leader of something. But it wasn't what God wanted. He made sure that there was no place or way for escape. And the sad thing was, is that the sign was a kiss. The guy that I kiss... The one whom I kiss, he's the man. And when evil purposes of sin is disguised with false love, we see someone who is hardened by sin to the point that they cannot even recognize their own wickedness. How are we doing? Are we guilty of being pious and righteous around church people? And yet in our heart not really care at all? about being right maybe to some this is no different than a social club meeting once a week I'm just here to pay my dues maybe you've come to a point where you're where the pleading of Christ's spirit is on your heart and it's become something that you have truly just blocked and you've not listened with spiritual ears and a spiritual heart for some time. Because the pain of betrayal is that you didn't start out wanting to betray Jesus. You started out trying to do right. You gave yourself mercy, love, and time to grow. But as, as you got further away from that first experience of forgiveness that God offered, you became calloused and fell into apathy and fell asleep spiritually. Folks, it's time to wake up our spirit and ask ourselves, why are we here? See, Jesus died for you, but he could have changed the narrative. What is our purpose? To love God and to love each other. Betrayers betray first of all themselves. We need to understand that. But the other thing is, is that we need to wake up our spirit. We need to wake up our spirit. Why? Because Jesus died for you, but he could have changed the narrative. But that would have negated the promise he made at the beginning of time as we know it. Because that is why God restrained from releasing his angels to go and take Jesus off the cross and save him. He promised us a way out of sin, away from our betrayal in the Spirit. In Matthew 26 and 56, it says, But all this, or this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. God kept his promise. Jesus kept his promise. If they hadn't, it would have been a betrayal against mankind. And the pain of betrayal is what keeps God, God. Because he's not going to betray us. So how do I change from being a betrayer to a follower? Be honest with God. Believe in the forgiveness that he's offered. Accept that forgiveness by washing away your sins and becoming his child. Then, 
be committed to righteousness as a lifestyle that you're willing to live. It takes a lot of prayer. But it's the answer for the child of God. If you're a child of God and you say, what do I need to do? How do I re retain my, my relationship with God? What do I need to do that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Who was he writing to? The Roman church. People who had already obeyed the gospel. People who were already in Christ. And he says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This is not written to the world. This is written to the church. What do we need to do? We as Christians need to do this. We need to confess that Jesus is Lord with our friends. That's why whenever Chris said that this morning, I didn't know where you were going with the invite your friend. I love that though. But you know why? Why is it that we want them to be excited and impressed? Because we want them to glorify God. That's it. It's all about him. Don't put it off. If you're not a Christian, what do you need to do? Be born again. How do you do that? By washing away your sins. You say, well, I don't understand. Stick around and give us a chance to talk to you. That's what we're here for. It's all about making disciples of our Lord. That's what we're about. We need to do that. And if you are a Christian, you need to confess his name in your daily walk. And that way, you will become a leader for Christ, great leadership makes a difference. I don't know where you are this morning, but I do know this. God knows where you are. God knows who you are. God knows what you need more than you do. You know, I, I love the fact that I can look at my God and say, thank you for leading me in the right direction. But sometimes whenever I take over, I make mistakes. Sometimes whenever I take over and do things my way, Things don't go the way that they should. The question is this morning is, how are you doing? Where do you stand this morning? Are you in Christ or outside of Christ? If you're in Christ, walk with him, confessing his name daily. If you're not in Christ, confess his name today. And if you need to respond in any way, come while we stand and while we sing. Just as I am.
Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Father, we're thankful for who you are and the power that you possess. Father, we understand that you are our creator. Father, you have control of everything that's around us. We can see it in the changing of the seasons and the birth of a child. Father, we know that you are a provider. You give to us, and we are always thankful for this. Father, we know that you love us. We see that through giving of your Son. And Father, we understand the power of your word, the power that it has in changing people's lives. Father, we're always mindful of the love that you have for us each and every day. Father, help us to be the Christians that you want us to be. Help us have that life within us. And Father, as we go out, may other people see that life within us through the way we live and the way we talk. Father, be with us and always guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>